Good morning and welcome to you uh, here at Benbrook United Methodist Church. We are so glad that you were tuning in with us today. I hope that you are well and as we come before each other this morning, let's go before God in a word of prayer. Gracious and holy God, we come before you thankful for this day, for this opportunity to gather for this opportunity to give you praise and glory. As we reflect on what it means yet again to follow after Jesus, teach us what it means in the midst of a world that is afraid and in the midst of the world that is full of fear at every corner, at every turn. Remind us of the light and the life that is within your Son, Jesus Christ. And lead us toward that light and show to us, reveal to us even more of your glory and help us to follow after you. Be with us in the request that we lift before your throne of mercy and grace. Those who are sick, those who are facing surgery, those who are recovering from it, those who find themselves alone, those who find themselves scared, those who find themselves depressed and discouraged and uncertain. We pray that in the midst of all of these that you would remain Lord and God and King over our lives. Be with us in our celebrations. Be with us in our moments of joy and rejoicing. And teach us to pray as your son Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror, which paralyzes needed efforts to convert, retreat into advance. In every, in every, ah, okay, sorry, all right. I don't usually slip up like this, that's okay. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror, which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. In every dark hour of our national life, a leadership of frankness, and a vigor has been met with that understanding and support of the people themselves, which is essential to victory. These are the words of Franklin Delano Roosevelt in his first inaugural address. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, of course, was appointed, was voted into office at a time in our nation's history when it was experiencing great turmoil, a, not, a time in our nation's history when the economy had been in free fall. And Herbert Hoover, who was before FDR, was 
not considered to be the one to lead our country forward. And so as FDR was put into this position, he summoned not only the great oratorical nature of this famous passage, but also a sense of resolve, a sense of a renewed vision of commitment to the country and of a way forward. And he examined it through the lens of what it meant to be afraid. The only thing we have to fear, Roosevelt said, is fear itself. Here we are, right? Decades later. In another economic crisis that we find ourselves in, thrust upon us by a pandemic that we are still reeling with. And regardless of where you sit on a political spectrum, there is a lot of fear and uncertainty. Fear over where we have been, fear over where we are going, fear over if we're making the right choices, fear over our leadership, fear over violence, fear over impeachment, fear over new policies, fear over vaccines, fear over so many things. And as we Think about fear itself. The question that I want to pose to you this morning is this. What does fear produce in you? For if we can understand what it is that fear produces in us, then perhaps we can move forward as individuals, as followers of Christ, as members of this great nation, what does fear produce in you? The scripture that we have this morning is found in Luke's gospel, and it's in chapter 5. We have been looking at the call of those first disciples, and we have looked at it in Matthew's gospel, and we have looked at it in John's gospel, and today we are going to look at it in Luke's gospel. And even though it is the same disciples that are called, the way that Luke tells the story is decidedly unique. And so there are things that we can learn about what it means to follow after Jesus and to follow after his call that we could not discern quite the same way in the other Gospels. Hear now these words from Luke chapter 5, starting with verse 1. Once, while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and cast, let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet, if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish, that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so that they 
began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' feet saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Sweet Holy Spirit, I pray that you would be present right now. I pray that my words would not be my own, but that they would be yours. I pray that my mind would not be my own, but that it would be yours. Most of all, sweet Holy Spirit, I pray that my heart would not be my own, but that it would be wholly thine, broken and open and honest before these people of God. Amen. So there are these basic myths that we have surrounding the nature of fear. We have one huge myth that seems to cloud over and around and, and, and just kind of hover over fear. Whenever we hear the word fear, we think it's awful. We think it's bad. We think fear is something that we should not have. If we are to be afraid, that is contrary to what God would have for us. If we are afraid, then the enemy wins. If we are afraid, then we can't get anything done. If we are afraid, the worst possible things can happen. And indeed, as FDR pointed out, the greatest thing we have to fear is fear itself. We are afraid of fear. In the very notion of the myth of fear that being afraid is a bad thing, we are afraid of fear. FDR was spot on with that. But here's the thing. It's a myth. At least from my vantage point, it is a myth that fear is always and everywhere and at all times and in all places and all circumstances a bad thing. Are there not moments in time where fear can be good? If we are those that see a fire in our house, we should be afraid and run out the back door, right? Or if there's a large beast in the woods that is looking at us with its beady eyes in the night, we should run away from it. There are times when we have needed fear in order to motivate us. Fear can produce reverence. Fear can produce lots of things. And what we want to look at today, as we look at the scripture in Luke and as we look at the passages leading up to it in Luke, we want to look at what fear produces. And we want to answer that question, or at least take a, an attempt at answering that question. What does fear produce in you? Now, one of the most Basic responses to fear, of course, is terror. I mean, we understand that people are terrorized whenever fear happens. But I want to dig down much deeper than that. If we look at Zechariah, if we look at the one who is to have the son, John the Baptist, if we look in 
Luke's gospel there in the first chapter, we see that he is there kind of in the holy of holies. It has been his time. He's been appointed that lot. And he's there when all of a sudden who should show up but an angel of the Lord. And that angel of the Lord terrifies Zechariah. Yes, but what does fear produce in Zechariah? It produces speechlessness. And how many times does fear produce in us speechlessness? It terrorizes us to the point that we do not know what to say, and so we are rendered speechless. We would like to be able to give voice to the situation, but we can't even scream. We are so overcome. And so it is that so often when we find ourselves afraid, we are speechless. If we go on a little further, we see there is a different response to fear. The angel of the Lord shows up later on in the chapter, in that first chapter of Luke, and instead of speechlessness, Mary responds to that angel with curiosity. The angel tells her, be not afraid, but before that, she ponders these things. She is curious about what is happening. She asks questions about it. And sometimes what fear produces in us is a sense of examination, a sense of asking questions, a sense of wanting to know why we are afraid, of why all of these things are happening. And there is something holy and beautiful about the questioning itself. Because again, another one of those myths of afraid and being afraid is that you are, you know, to just go boldly on and never ask questions and just do what orders have been told you. And no, Mary instead responds with curiosity. The mother of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ responds with questions. And contrary to getting in trouble, she finds that she is blessed indeed. And so there is a certain sense to which what fear produces in us, curiosity may not be such a bad thing. Pondering may not be such a bad thing. Asking questions may not be such a bad thing. What does fear produce in you? What about, what about hiding? Right? The shepherds are out in the field. They are keeping watch over their flocks by night. When all of a sudden the glory of the Lord shines before them and around them, they have nowhere to go. And if there were any place that they could go, if there were any place they could be other than there, they would be there. They would be in hiding. If they could hide under a rock or a blade of grass or a sheep, which is a bit of a funny sight to imagine, then they would do that. But they can't go anywhere. And how many times is it that what fear produces in us is it produces a sense of hiding? Right? Our response to fear is to go into hiding, to go into a corner, to crawl under the covers. How many times as parents have you been afraid of your child and gone into the bathroom and locked the door? How many times has fear produced hiding in you? But you know what? There are other responses to fear still leading up to our scripture today. Keep in mind there is that fear can produce image control, right? In in Luke chapter 3, verse 7, we see where fear produces image control. John is in the wilderness. He is baptizing people left and right. And there are people that are coming out and John says, you know, not all of you are coming out because of the right motive. You're coming out because you're afraid. John said to the crowd that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come, bear fruits worthy of repentance? John calls them out in their fear. They want to do it because other people around them are doing it? They want to do it so they look good. 
They want to say we don't need to do it because we're already good. There's a sense of image control. And how often is it that fear produces in us a sense of image control and that we want other people to not think that we are afraid? Because if they think that we are afraid, then that will mean that we are vulnerable. And that is a horrible thing. And that is a bad thing to be afraid in that way. And what fear produces in us is a sense to which we have to control our persona and our image. As if vulnerability is a bad thing. And yet I want to reiterate to you that vulnerability is a hallmark, very much can be a hallmark of good leadership. Because vulnerability produces humility. And leaders that lead wisely lead with humbleness. Vulnerability is not such a bad thing. What does fear produce in you? Does it produce anger? Does fear produce anger in you because it produces anger in quite a lot of people? Keep in mind that Jesus is preaching a little later on in, in chapter 4. And as he's preaching in chapter 4, he's, he's, um, he's finding that he is reading from the scroll of Isaiah in Nazareth is kind of one of his hometowns. And he says, the Lord has, you know, sent me to proclaim good news to the captives and release uh, recovery of sight to the blind and all this stuff. And, and then he goes on to talk about Elijah and he goes on to talk about people not being received in their hometown. And they're afraid of him. At the end of the day, his knowledge is something that scares them. And their response, what fear produces in them, is anger. They are infuriated that he knows more than they do. They are infuriated because he is insulting them. They are infuriated that somehow he, they feel he has belittled them. But out of their fear, they respond with ignorance and they respond with anger. And how many times do we see in our world today that when people are afraid, they lash out with anger? Rather than seek to be curious and to ask questions, rather than to seek and to ponder, it is that fear which produces this sense of unease and causes people to lash out in anger. People did it in Jesus' day toward Jesus. People do it in our day. Fear produces anger. What does fear produce in you? What about endless chatter, right? There is a man with un, an unclean spirit in, the star, uh, in, chapter, in verse 31. There's a story about how he has these demons, and as these demons come out of him, the demons cry out, what have you to do with us? Jesus of Nazareth in verse 34. Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. The Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And again, later on in that chapter, there are others, that are demons that come out, and they want to talk to and identify Jesus. And how many times is our response to fear one where we seek to talk it through, right? We get anxious. We get afraid. We get scared. And we're like, if I just analyze this situation enough, right? If I just go through all the possible ways that it could be resolved. If I just, that's how I'm going to get through my fear. But, you know, just being able to talk and talk and talk and talk and talk, sometimes we can't exhaust that list. And sometimes we just get to the end of the day tired. And so what fear produces in us, that is that endless chatter that doesn't lead to resolution. Because at the end of the day, what we really want is we want to be rid of fear instead of to sit with it and instead of letting it produce something that is holy, instead of letting it produce something that is good, instead of letting us move forward, we let the chatter become our Lord and we are servants to it. And our heart and our spirit are not any better for it. And we are exhausted. But here in the scripture, fear produces something else. 
in Luke 5, in this calling story, fear produces unworthiness. For you see, Simon Peter is a fisherman, and Jesus is not. But Jesus comes to Simon Peter and his crew, his other brother, and then John and James, sons of Zebedee. He's not walking all along the shore like he was in Matthew's gospel. He's not walking along, and John the Baptist points him out. But there is a crowd following him, and he has to find a way to get to that crowd. And so he says, can I borrow your boat for a little bit? What do you want our boat for, Rabbi? I got to talk to him. And if I get out on this boat and you push out a little ways, it will echo out from around the rocks and around this, off the sea and onto the land, and people will be able to hear me. And he sits down. He doesn't even stand up. He sits down on the boat to talk to them in an unassuming position, not one of fear at all. And after the crowds leave, after they're, he's done talking to them, he says, hey, why don't you push out a little further? And by the way, why don't you cast your nets back in the sea? Okay, whatever you say, Rabbi. You are the teacher. We believe you. We'll obey you. You kind of wonder, are they at a point of belief at this point or are they just at a point where they will obey him, right? Because there are people in our lives for whom we obey their orders, but we don't necessarily believe them. We are skeptical of them. I kind of imagine Peter is kind of in that mode. He's kind of stuck there. He, he obeys the rabbi. He obeys the teacher, but he does not fully understand the extent to who this teacher is, what this teacher is. At this point, he doesn't know. You see, in John's gospel, he knows because John the Baptist has pointed him out. In Matthew's gospel and in Mark's gospel, he hears the voice of Jesus. Come and follow me. And all of a sudden, they drop everything and they follow him. But here in Luke's gospel, it's different. He's been teaching. and They've been absorbing his words. They understand he's uh, a rabbi. They understand he's got some powerful things to say. And that's all well and good. But you want us to throw some nets overboard? You're not a fisherman. But I guess everybody's entitled to their own, and the rabbi asked us to, so we'll go ahead and throw it over. But something miraculous happens when they begin to pull up those nets, something that they could not have predicted. See what happens? Put out your, into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing yet. If you say so, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. There wasn't a place to put all the fish. There were more fish in the boat than there were in the sea. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. You see, there was this understanding that you're fine when you're on land, but even fishermen of the day were a little wary of the water. You wouldn't think that people who are out on the sea would be wary of water at all, but that's not true because there's only a certain sense to which you can see down into the depths of that water. You don't know what might lie underneath. You don't know the chaos that might be underneath it. You don't know the sea monsters that might be underneath it. And there certainly was a belief that there were sea monsters down in a lot of these places. 
And so fishermen had a certain sense of fear of what lay beneath. But see, here is the rabbi who suddenly becomes Lord of all creation. For he is not just talking to people on land, but he is talking to people out in the sea, and he is bringing up the depths of creation from the sea. There is something powerful, for he has control of the sea as well as the land. And you see in this moment that Simon Peter is overcome. He has this fear, and it leads a response in him. It produces a response in him of unworthiness. I, I can't. He's not speechless, but he doesn't feel worthy to be in his presence. It's not often that fear produces unworthiness. It can produce many of the other things that I've mentioned, but unworthiness? And yet Jesus' response to him is instructional to us because he sees the humility that Peter has. He sees the vulnerability that Peter has. Peter shows his hand. He doesn't have a poker face. Jesus reads him like a book. And if we are wise, we understand that Jesus can read us like a book too. But his response to Peter is this. Jesus said to Simon Peter, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. <laughs> don't be afraid. You who don't know how to catch fish, I know how to catch fish. And not only that, you're also going to help me catch people. It's ironic, isn't it? That here is one for whom just a few minutes earlier they thought had great oratorical skills to be able to lead people and to teach people, but turns out that he's master of the sea as well as the land. But if there is one who is master of the sea as well as the land, should not that be the one that you follow, Jesus says? Should it not be that you follow after me because I will teach you to catch people? That I will teach you to be fishers of men? Should that not be how you are to respond to fear? We can wallow in unworthiness, but that's not where Jesus wants us to be. Jesus wants us to follow after him. Jesus wants us to be led by him. Fear produces a response of gratitude in us, not unworthiness. Fear produces in us a response that we are to listen, that we are to lean in, that we are to learn from him. Fear is that which will teach us who we are to hang out with. Jesus calls a few verses after this, Levi, the tax collector. There were people who were whispering that you should not hang out with tax collectors and prostitutes. But was Jesus afraid? No. Fear teaches us that we should not be afraid of hanging out with the wrong crowd when we follow after Jesus. Fear teaches us not only that we should not be afraid about who we hang out with, but also those religious traditions that are really more superstitions. Fasting. John's disciples are concerned with the question of fasting near the end of chapter five, and yet Jesus says, you've got the bridegroom with you. It's a time for celebration, not for fasting. There are religious traditions and superstitions out there in our lives that don't amount to a hill of beans. Are you more afraid of getting those wrong? Of not crossing your fingers? Of stepping around that black cat? There are other superstitions that you are afraid of and they are motivating you. Don't be afraid of that, Jesus says, if you are to follow after me. Not only that, don't be 
afraid to fully embrace blessing that does not seem like blessing. Blessing that comes in the most unlikely of places. Blessing that comes in poverty. Blessing that comes with not having an abundance of stuff, but with having little. Blessing that doesn't look like anything the world has. Don't be afraid of not having enough resources, for if you have me, you will have enough, Jesus says. Jesus says, don't be afraid in the way that a response that leads to hatred, but respond to hatred with love instead. For there are plenty of people out there that live their life full of venom, that live their life full of hatred. Don't be one of those people. And when you have the chance to respond to fear, don't respond to it with judgment and with wrath. Respond to it with hope and with promise. And finally, be about the work of responding to fear by showing the fruit that you do have. Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Bear fruit that is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Bear those fruits. What does fear produce in you? Have you been led astray producing things that are not worthy? Have you been led off track? Have you let anger? Have you let endless chatter? Have you let any number of other responses get the better of you and let fear get the better of you? When we follow after Jesus, yeah, it can be scary. But God calls us into something greater. God calls us into deeper waters that we may fish for people. Go forth and fish in Jesus' name. Amen.
We're glad you have stayed with us as we enter into this time of Holy Communion. And as we do so, I hope that you have your bread and your juice with you. If not, you are more than welcome to go and grab those at this time. Pause the video for a sec while we gather together for Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise, and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us. He took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, Make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Receive now this benediction. May you go forth from this place, recognizing that we can't escape fear. It is present in our lives. But what does fear produce in you? May fear produce a following after Jesus, seeking his teachings, seeking his word, seeking his healing, seeking his grace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, go forth. Amen. <laughs>